show you is are some of the studies we have conducted uh, in our university with other uh, with collaborators from other universities in Mexico. But uh, all the publications are uploaded in research case. So if you are interested in some of them, find it. Uh, as you know, uh, uh, in addition to genetic, the genetic risk factors, there are modified risk factors that started just before pregnancy. Uh, one of the risk factors is pregestational obesity, but then there are prenatal uh, risk factors such as undernutrition, obesity during pregnancy, and gestational diabetes. There are postnatal uh, risk factors, preschool and elementary school factors that we pointed out in this article from Diabetes Care in 2004. Uh, we talk about the pregestational obesity among 18 to uh, 49 year old women. Uh, in the last national uh, health survey in Mexico, it showed that obesity, that means higher than 30 uh, square meters, it was from 18% to 43%. Uh, they found that the, uh, there was during pregnancy high fat consumption and low and high energy consumption depending on the socioeconomic level of the population. We did a study about gestational diabetes uh, to see how doctors uh, will meet the, guide, the Mexican guidelines of uh, the diagnosis and treatment of gestational diabetes in two inst of the uh, larger institutions in Mexico. And almost none uh, follow the Mexican guidelines. Uh, when they, by chance, uh, diagnosis, uh, diagnose somebody with gestational diabetes, they didn't follow uh, the adequate uh, treatment guidelines. So there is there one, or well, there is in these three uh, uh, cases, uh, risk factors among, uh, among Mexicans uh, children. In the national uh, survey, National Health Survey, we also found that 10% of, of the children of the bare weight were low, low weight, bare weight, and 20% were, uh, were high uh, bare weight. That means that they are in high risk of developing later in life uh, any of the components of metabolic syndrome. This study we, we conducted in three states of Mexico, two, in two cities that uh, borders uh, the Mexico-US border, one in the northern western uh, city of uh, Tijuana that makes border to California, uh, one in the northeastern part of uh, Mexico uh, that is uh, Reynosa that makes border to uh, last, uh, Texas, and uh, one city in Chiapas, uh, in the capital of Chiapas, Tuxla Gutierrez, uh, this state makes border to Guatemala. And although we found differences, we, we can see that 90% uh, of winning is before six months of age. And the introduction of sugar sweetened beverage and chips is before six months of age. You know the, the period where the preferences and dislikes uh, of foods develop in the first two years of life. And that 60% of 12 to 24 months, all toddlers have sugar sweetened beverage or chips. They include it in the milk, in the formula milk, or they give, give them uh, uh, sugar, they added sugar to just to water. And, that, and we also found that the consumption of chips and sweetened beverage was strongly associated with overweight and obesity. Uh, what the, uh, what, what we found there that 77% of children with normal weight have maternal feeding, while only 44% of children with obesity have maternal feeding. 
and children with overweight have less snack time, less maternal feeding, and eat out home more often. Sorry, what snack time? Snap time, period. Uh, oh, sleeping during the day. Oh, oh okay. 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 Is that the? Uh, yes. Sorry. Those first two st statistics are those uh, first six months maternal feeding. <coughs> this yes. Okay. The, another of the problems that we have in Mexico may due uh, perhaps to the fact that Mexico used to be a country of undernourished children and mothers uh, and grandmothers uh, saw that children undernourished would die soon. The Mexican uh, mothers think that the uh, chubby children are healthier. So they don't. They 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 think that if they have a, a thin children, a, a regular white children, they need to be uh, fed more because they could die. And so they uh, they underestimate the weight status of the children. And what we also found is that doctors also underestimate the weight status of children, even pediatrics, uh, pediatricians. So uh, underestimation, it, it could be also a risk factor. Now, what we uh, found was that 43% of parents underestimated their children weight status, and 84% of parents had overweight or were obese. At the national level, the last year national health and nutrition survey showed that 72% uh, of women had overweight or obese, <coughs> were obese and 69% uh, of men, so it's an average of 71%. And we found that mothers who are with overweight, with obese children, those with income equal or lower than $7,200 a year, with lower years of formal education, and migrants underestimate the weight of the children more often. When we're talking about migrants are Mexican migrants that come from the south. We didn't have the migrants in, uh, in, the, in the study conducted in Chiapas, but we have migrants in the study conducted in the northern cities. Uh, that, uh, from parents who come from the southeast or the central part of Mexico. And they, they, they underestimate more, and a high percentage of parents wish that the children were less active. Uh, that's another of our risk factors in, in the children population of Mexico because they wanted to be quiet and that's an indicator that they would like them to be uh, uh, before the TV or before any video games. Uh, a high percentage of mothers do not believe uh, uh, that soft drinks and chips it might be deleterious to the children's health. And those were the youngest. This is another study that we, we, we explored the beliefs about causes, uh, implications, and treatment of obesity. And what we found is although most <coughs> mothers understand that sedentarism and that the, the high intake of uh, uh, high fat uh, foods and high caloric foods were cause of obesity, there were a pretty 15%, important 15% of mothers that do not believe that soft drinks and chips were unhealthy, and 15% of mothers do not believe that physical activity was healthy. Well, we found that older than 30 years and more than six years of education <coughs> and women with overweight had better knowledge about causes of obesity. We also study the preschool children with a catalog of pictures that we made of different, picture, different pictures in, uh, uh, among children who were in pre uh, preschool care. And we wanted to see which, uh, at that age, which were the food that they liked the most and which were the food that they disliked the most. 
and the most preferred food were ice cream, chips, and ice lolly that are consistent with other studies that have been conducted in the USA and in Australia. And the less preferred food were quincy jelly, coffee, and avocado. The overweight children had more preference for quincy jelly, fruits and syrup, and vegetable soup. And the low income children and those at public nursery preferred less healthy foods. When adjusted to father education, family income, and parent preference of foods, children at public nursing prefer healthier foods. But the most preferred foods were high caloric density foods. We could go to a school, elementary school children. We did this study with the, the group of uh, people, with professor, uh, uh, pediatrician, Professor Mel Heyman. We applied the same questionnaire in people from Central America and, and Mexico in the Bay Area of San Francisco and in Tijuana and Tecate. And what we found was that children with obese parents had higher risk of obesity, and children from migrant parents had higher risk of obesity and had higher intake of chips, migrant parents to Tijuana, and higher the consumption of chips, uh, higher the risk of obesity. However, these are cross-sectional studies. In another study that we did in Chiapas, the southeast of Mexico, among Mexican adolescents from middle to high class, we found that eating out was associated with metabolic syndrome among 12 to 16-year-old uh, children. Uh, to our surprise in Mexico and in Latin America, there had not been any study looking at uh, the effects of uh, television advertising among children and among adult population. <coughs> so we, uh, we knew that there is a regulation in Mexico that uh, is from more than 15 years ago that stated that uh, uh, it is not allowed to advertise any, any uh, advertise that could be deleterious to the health. However, we, we did uh, explore uh, what uh, the advertising were uh, geared toward the programs of children. And we found out that four food-related advertising were geared every half an hour during programs geared toward children. That is more or less the same that happened in, in the USA in 1923. 90, 1993. So we are just uh, like you 20 years ago. Um, more than half of those foods were highly dense caloric foods. And for those who are interested in Mexican America, uh, this uh, advertising are also broadcasted uh, in the USA by the same uh, channels. Then what we did was uh, a systematic review of randomized clinical trials to see if there were effects of the food advertising over the consumption of food by children and by adults. What we found was, uh, and we published the uh, Nutrition Hospitalaria, that there were only three studies in preschool children four studies in elementary school children, and three studies in adult population. <coughs> the three studies in preschool children and the four studies in school children consistently show that the effect of advertising on the consumption of food. As a matter of fact, in Sweden, since 1993, it is forbidden any advertising of food or toys geared toward children. Because they found out that the, the children is, are unable to differentiate between advertising and the true program. <coughs> so they, they ban it. That it has caused the, they, it has also adapted in, in, in Greece and, and in Norway, but they, it has caused a lot of uh, international problems within the European Union. So what we, uh, as, uh, as you know, uh, as you could imagine, the education, 
the health education and all the levels of education are not the same between the Swedish stuff and the Mexicans. We try to do that uh, in uh, uh, TV advertising broadcasts toward the mothers of children of less than one year. Most what, uh, of them uh, saw novellas or soap opera from 6 to 10 o'clock. <coughs> and what we found was that six foot advertising every half an hour were addressed during the soap opera programs. The most often advertising were complete dairy products, sweetened cereals, sweetened beverage, chips, and non-sweetened cereals. As I told you before, that is forbidden from in Mexico for the more than 10 years. And the foods advertised consumed more frequently by the mothers were dairy products, sweetened cereals, non-sweetened cereals, and sweetened beverages. And we also found an association between the number of food advertised and the food consumed by mothers and their children. <coughs> uh, we are going to present uh, uh, on the May the 12th in Liverpool in the European Congress of Obesity this study that was uh, uh, where we explored the food consumption in and out of. Uh, preschool and elementary school children, we conducted uh, 2,700 questionnaires uh, to see to assess the lunch packs they take from home. Uh, it was observed that 99% of preschool children had lunch pack prepared at home, a higher percentage than in elementary school children. And none of the lunch pack we, we assess the, if they were adequate according to the Ministry of Health and if they were healthy, according to um, uh, an index that we, we thought that it would be a, a good index for just for a snack time, like having fruit, vegetable, not processing food, and, uh, and water. And what we found was that uh, none of the lunch pack of the elementary school children was classified as healthy and only 1% was cl classified as adequate. Among preschool children, 21% of the lunch packs were classified as, he as healthy and 6% as adequate. And more than half of the children recognized the brand names of food high in fat, salt, and other sugar available inside and outside of the school. This, my question is like, but is there a reason that even though I presented that uh, last Friday at the National Meeting of Pediatrics. Okay. Um, the problem is that the pressure of academics and the pressure from um, professional association are always less than the pressure from the food industry and the TV industry. But the, uh, it has been pointed out about. Uh, as a matter of fact, this is you is, uh, why we, we look at the brand name? Because uh, it was launched uh, a program against obesity in January 1911, yeah. no, 2011. And they tried to ban all these uh, uh, junk foods. And the first thing that the, the, the industry said was that we shouldn't call it uh, junk food. And the government agreed. And the academics who work for the government agree. The second thing was that they say, well, you we should do, sh you should allow uh, certain foods, certain number of foods that we produce, and we promise that it will be reduced of salt, uh, fat, and, and, and carbohydrate, and refined carbohydrate. And they allow at the first time 200, and the second time 550. But what is, uh, even though if they are less salty and less fat and with less uh, uh, high carbohydrate content, uh, there are studies uh, made by Tom Robinson and uh, et al. and some others that have shown that the only, 
the, the fact that uh, a child see a brand name, that will be enough for the children to ask their mother to purchase food from that brand. So they, they have a smaller packages, but with the brand of these, uh, these uh, companies. Um, how did they what did they use to classify healthy versus not healthy? Well, mm -hmm. uh, what they we 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 decided to classify healthy if they have fruit, vegetable, and water, and not processed food. We as as, as a group. Uh, what the government has said is that it's what we call adequate. Is that they have all the foods that have the well-being dish, that are fruit, vegetable, and a food prepared from that could be high, <coughs> with high content of fat, with, with, with the meat and the dairy products, also that all that. That could be, we, we have evaluated two different, two different indices. But this is another study that we uh, this, is, uh, this is an adult population, and uh, this study is coming, uh, coming up in May at this uh, journal, Journal of Healthcare for the Poor on the Service, a journal from Columbia University. Uh, we started looking at the, what is called the walkability index. It's a walkability index that has been used by, by, by Professor Salis and has shown that the, in places where there is uh, more walkability, there will be uh, less obesity. And that would apply to Mexico, because we suspect that it would not. Uh, and as a matter of fact, we, we found that uh, in 322 individuals, 17% per females, we did this randomized in four uh, neighborhoods that were, combi by combi were elected by convenience, selected by convenience, one of middle to high socioeconomic status, two of middle socioeconomic status, and one of lower socioeconomic status. We found that uh, the prevalence of obesity and abdominal obesity was 27% and 43.5 respectively, and that the odds ratio for obesity and abdominal obesity among those living in the lowest income neighborhood was 2.4 and 7.8 compared with those living in a middle class neighborhood. That was much more important than the walkability index, than the number of cars. Uh, in Mexico, well, in the high socioeconomic status, the average car were three. In the low socioeconomic status, the population were less than one. In the high socioeconomic status, there were no convenience store. In the Laos economic status, there were one or two convenience stores every uh, 100 yards. But that convenience store are completely different at the stores here. And that's what makes the difference. Make the difference because there are only junk foods. There are not fruits, there are no vegetables, there are nothing. There are just a, a household convenience store for survival. And the only thing that they, they sell are softenings. Uh, we have also studied the perception and attitudes toward obesity because, uh, as you know, in addition to, uh, to underestimate the, the wider status, there are uh, an astigmatization of, uh, of the people with excess of grass that has been shown in the UK, in the US, and Australia. And we want to see what is, is happening in Mexico. And what we found was a high percentage of physicians, teachers, and parents underestimated children with status. And the teachers with higher underestimation toward children with status had the strongest bias toward the child with obesity and believed more frequently that the problem of obesity it can be resolved by children with power. So they, they practically, practically unknown or do not recognize the fact that there are risk factors that like genetics and there are risk factors that could program chil uh, children to adult population during pregnancy, 
and just before four years of age. You will see this is more some of the statements we asked them. Uh, sorry. And this is to teachers and parents. Most of these children are aggressive. Half of them said yes, or agree or not sure about the statement. Most of these children have been spoiled, 60%. Of these children rarely show their own feelings, 57%. Most of these children are lazy, 61%. And most of these children have anger control problems. Then everybody thinks, almost everybody thinks, that that be, could be prevented just by self-control. That is just a problem of lifestyle changes, and that most children can lose weight if they change their food habits. And that's the message, message that has been addressed by the te television, that has been addressed by the government, and by the physicians. When we see, when we look at what do physicians believe uh, about the obese child, 66% agree or are not sure with the negative statements toward the obese child. 73% agree or are not sure with the statement that give responsibility of the obese child to obese child and her lack of willpower. And 20% are uncertain with the statement that the responsibility of the obese child is his or her lack of willpower. So it would Oh, I was just going to ask too, did, did, was this asked about obese children and then normal weight children and underweight children, or how was the, um, was it just asked of obese children? I didn't know if there was a only, only we, we only asked about people with uh, children with excess of fat. Okay. Okay. We didn't, we didn't uh, uh, compare with the regular uh, weight children and uh, underweight. Okay. Then what, uh, we, we, we did another study looking at the pictogram made by Stunker that has uh, six silhouettes, one with a regular white child, one with an obese child, one with a child <coughs> in a wheelchair, one with an scare, one with crutches. And we asked them to, to pick up which would they like to be as a first choice uh, to be a friend, to be his friend. And the first choice was, out of six silhouettes, was the normal way. And the last choice was an excess fat child. And when we asked that to the children with excess fat, the answer was the same. And we, we asked the mothers of the obese children, the answer was the same. They wanted for his children, for their children, a regular way, a uh, friend. This only, there are many schematic representations of the risk factors of obesity made by, by geneticists. Uh, some of them say that the genetics only involves 20%, some others say 30 to 70%. And Proyeto said that uh, it, it will depend also on the grade of obesity you have. The greater BMI you have, the major influence of genes, of genetics. And the lower uh, BMI, the greater the influence of environment. And that's something that it doesn't take into account in all the intervention problems. This is another, uh, uh, it's called the uh, ecological uh, model. This is, uh, there are many, many, many schematic representations. This is the from Fembrenner's, where they, 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 they explain that the behaviors, behaviors of everybody will not depend only on willpower but for many contingencies. Like uh, if we are talking about a child, the family, the classroom mate, the siblings, the peers, then there is an extended uh, the exosystem uh, contingency that will include the extended family, the school board, neighborhoods, mass media, 
parent world environments. And then there is a macro system that involves the legislator, the government, the culture, the economic system, the social condition, and the history. Uh, fortunately, in Mexico, we have all these environments that are obesogenic. So we are having problems, genetic problems, but we are having environmental problems that facilitate that. If we mix those those uh, schemes, doesn't be it shouldn't be necessary like that, but there are some influence for genes, some social cultural contingencies, some community contingencies, and, and all of these could start during pregnancy when children are programmed to become obese, or at least until the four years of life. And that's why it's so difficult that uh, in to find good results in intervention programs. As a matter of fact, we, we have conducted uh, several uh, systematic uh, reviews uh, of randomized clinical trials in children and the school uh, and elementary school uh, children and the results are really really very light very light and very inconsistent that doesn't mean that there is a role of parents family and teachers about children feeding they choose the feeding method they choose the ability of, uh, of food at home and at schools, the time to play and do sports activities. They are learning models regarding food habits and physical activity, and they, they might control the time of TV exposure and physical activity involvement, and the way parents, family, and teachers interact <coughs> with the children during the period. In addition to that, to that, those roles, there is a role of health personnel, the professional association, the academics, the governments, the House of Representatives, the mass media, and the food industry. In conclusion, uh, in addition to genetics, there are many modifiable environment risks that initiate before pregnancy. Obesity is facilitated in different environments at the family level, including TV and video games, at the school, and at the community level. And it's a complex problem that requires changes that are responsibility of many actors. That include parents, teachers, health personnel, entrepreneurs, mass media, legislation, legislators, and government. This is part of our team. The permanent team is Monserrat Bacardi, Eugenia Pedro Morales, <coughs> and Aliria Mendaris. Most of them have been a, a students of us. Uh, Octelina Ruiz is a professor in, at the Universidad de Tamaulipas. Sally Mandujano at the Universidad de Chiapas, <coughs> Rosa Velasco. And Melvin Heyman, Janet Bruchiski are from UCSF. Thank you very much. I thought I was hearing you say that parents prefer that their kids are quiet and sitting by the TV and that made them overweight. So that usually meant that they were also not very healthy. But then when, towards the end when you were asking those questions about what are your preferences, people including parents and teachers picked people who were on target for weight and who were healthy. So could you, am I misinterpreting that or could you explain why no. that's a difference? Well, we, there were, they both were two studies, two different studies, but I could speculate that uh, there are only 15 percent who, uh, 15 to 20 percent who did disregard physical activity, and they, they really want the children to be, to be quiet. But there are some others that are not. So the minority of the parents. Yeah, that the minority of parents. Quiet kids. Yeah, but the. Uh, the more, the, I think, uh, what I wanted to point out is that the knowledge that has been shown up uh, with uh, smoking uh, in doctors and 
algorithms. Uh, it's not enough to change the behavior uh, and the attitudes toward any any health problem. It is it's a, it's a learning process that uh, it should be involved by many many actors. Yes. Um, going kind of like along with that, since it seems like the the government is kind of fighting from both sides, you know, that they have to deal with the food industry and what they want, and the physicians seem to have the wrong viewpoint as well, almost. Um, the, the, wrong? the wrong viewpoint, almost, or yes. like they mm -hmm. don't understand it completely. Mm -hmm. So, and I know we've talked about the Healthy Plate initiative that you guys worked on mm -hmm. um, for children. Are there other initiatives going on? In Ago that are trying to help inform physicians directly, so that way they can inform their patients? At the national level, no. There are not initiatives, uh, and that's, that's a very important question, and I think that should be addressed. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to, to address, the, the, to change our uh, nutrition uh, and obesity education toward the medical students. What we are we are planning to do now is at least in our medical school is to follow up the belief they have every year and then after the nutrition class they have with us uh, to see if there, there is any change. But at the national level, I haven't heard about it. Mm -hmm. Yes? Primero, gracias por la presentación. Me interesa mucho. And my question is, I'm not sure the rates of obesity in Mexico versus the United States? And if you could say, if you think, because I know you did studies in Tijuana, so if there are families where they sort of see obesity in the U.S. versus seeing it in Mexico, if they travel across the border, and if you think that influences their perceptions of obesity. Well, I think uh, uh, there are many ways that uh, the food habits may be influenced by Mexicans toward uh, the people who live in the U.S. My TV and my phone number, many uh, the <coughs> women usually hear what the grandma say about the, uh, feeding the children. So there is that, uh, that effect. On the other hand, uh, uh, in Mexico, in, in the USA, uh, fast foods are very cheap. So that's what uh, Mexican Americans uh, go to, to fast food and don't go to, to Mexico. Mm -hmm. Because the cost of, of, a, of a combo in, in the US, it will, be, it, it will cost about one hour work. And in Mexico, it will cost about one day work. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 that's, uh, the fast food, is, is mostly for the middle to high income once a month. Mm -hmm. <coughs> there is a myth that the Americans are damaging the Mexican with fast food, because uh, it's not. We have our own bad food. <laughs> <laughs> high fat, uh, high, uh, high carbohydrate. I have a question. Is the primary barrier to eating more healthy food more um, food preference that they just Prefer, low income communities prefer more high fat, you know, sweetened foods, or is it also cost? Is it expensive in some of these communities to get fresh fruits and vegetables? And yeah, the, 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 the two are, are, are problems in Mexico. It is more expensive to get fruit and vegetables. When I uh, spent uh, some time in London in 1979 doing a master at the University of London, I told them that they thought, because they, they always uh, thought that in developing countries we eat more fiber rather than in developed countries. And I told them that we, don't, we are not hanging on the trees <laughs> eating food. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Surprise. <laughs> <laughs> uh, really, uh, so uh, the, the fruits and vegetables that are good in Mexico are exported. And you go to, to a supermarket, they are in a low-income area, they are spoiled and expensive. They are rotten and expensive. 
so it's not so appealing to eat fruits and vegetables. And, it's, uh, and then there are some areas where there are not uh, electricity all the time. So it's easier to have uh, soft drinks than water. There is no water, uh, potable water, and the milk available in rural areas and in most urban areas are uh, with the high fat content. And in addition to the preference that they, that they have developed in the first, first years of life. Go ahead. <laughs> I know you've collaborated <coughs> with people all over the world, many, many different countries on, on uh, childhood obesity. And I'm curious, you mentioned, uh, you know, Mexico, there were what, four um, advertisements per uh, half hour show, which is about 20 years behind the U.S. And I'm curious if you see that Mexico's trajectory uh, on childhood obesity is close to a particular country. Do you see it being similar to any other areas that? Um, it, it is. It is difficult to to compare between mm -hmm. countries. Although the uh, WHO tried to do that, those are reports from the governments. Mm -hmm. So whatever they do, and then uh, is uh, what the government wants they to to show. Secondly, the, the kind of uh, methodology they can use in Egypt or in uh, or India could be different than that in Mexico. But what I've heard is that India and Egypt have more or less the same problems. Mm. In Mexico, we say that we have the highest prevalence of childhood obesity because ours is higher than in the USA. But it's a little bit lower than the Mexica, that, that Mexican American in the USA. Mm -hmm. um, yes. And so going back to your lunch packs that you evaluated, I actually found it was really interesting. Um, and the kids who didn't bring lunch packs, do they get a meal from the school? Well, the, we, they get, but it's not like here. Okay. There are not, uh, there are food canteens, but you, they sell. And they used to sell whatever, all junk foods. And it was it was banned uh, one and a half year ago, and they are now sell permitted foods, mm. but come from many of them come from the same uh, same same companies, but in, with in a shorter amount so that they can uh, eat twice and pay twice. <laughs> uh, the other thing is that when they do something like sandwiches and tortas, they are filled up uh, with cream with the high fat cream, mayonnaise, and all that. Even the salads, even the salad, they eat salad, they eat with a lot of dressing. That it will increase the, the high fat content. Thank you. Is there a big difference in the availability of um, high fat versus healthy foods in rural areas? In rural areas. Uh, I work, we worked in rural area, in rural area in Chiapas, but it was 25 years ago, and there was a great difference. Uh, I would say that the only thing that is not, there is no great difference is in the availability of soft drinks. Mm. There are more in rural areas. Mm. The Coca-Cola trucks get everywhere. Where <laughs> you cannot get, you have to walk. But, but they get there. If they don't get there, they have many men in the village that carry on their backs. So they can have Coca-Cola, Pepsi-Cola, all this kind. But that, that has become in Mexico and in rural areas part of the traditional Mexican food. Because that, that comes from 1940s. So that's three generations that have had that. The, the Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola company have been very smart, and they have uh, took all the, the caciques, we call it, the, the Indian leaders of the community, uh, and they give the concessions. Uh, when you, they, they, have them, they give them the monopoly to sell the soft drinks. So they, they, everything they organize, they sell, and they, they profit from that. So that, that's, that's a great resistance because it's, it's owned by, by the leaders or by the teachers. Thank you so much.
Thank you.